the reality is that, yes, Putin pocket any concessions that we give him until such a moment that he sees new opportunities to further his influence, to further erode Western solidarity, to further undermine the West. And he will exploit those opportunities because this is part of a broader vision that he has about the world. I'm Venetia Rainey, and this is Battle Lines. Regardless of who stands with Israel, Israel will fight until this battle is won. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. I made wartime decisions. I know the choices are never clear or easy for the leadership. I just find bombs and I find dead people, but it's a really scary thing for me. On this bonus episode of Battle Lines, The Telegraph's David Knoll speaks to Professor Sergei Rodchenko to discuss his upcoming book, To Run the World, The Kremlin's Cold War Bid for Global Power. Professor Rodchenko shares with us what he discovered about the psychology of the Kremlin's decision-making during the Cold War and what this can tell us about Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. Sergei Rodchenko, can you explain, first of all, why you decided to write this book? So uh, this project has been in the writing for 10 years. It's one of those things that you write once in your life and then never attempt something like this again. It is a big book, but there are really two reasons for doing this. First, I simply had access to documents like nothing that we have seen before. In Moscow and also in China, I spent about five years in China working through documents and had uh, access to top uh, policy making material for the Cold War period. Also in Russia, a lot of people assume that everything is secret, but actually they've been declassifying stuff. It's just we haven't seen this stuff, right? So I had access to these materials and then I realized there are so many untold stories and there's so much about the Cold War than we, that we think we know, but in reality, we don't know enough about. And so I decided to write a kind of a history of the Cold War, sort of one reason. And the second reason is actually it builds on the first reason because I had so many documents looking particularly at the personal motivations of Soviet and Chinese decision makers. How I, I came to understand them as human beings at a much deeper level than before. It, I had a, almost a sense of being there in the room with them as they were making decisions. And so I thought, why not write a very personalized history of the Cold War, really driving into their motivations, trying to uncover the sources for their behavior? That really hasn't been done in the same kind of way, simply because we did not have the documentary basis. Well, we'll get into that because that's absolutely fascinating. But for you, what do you think the Soviet plan for the post-Second World War world, what did it look like and what were they trying to do? So that is a very interesting question because, you know, there has been a debate among historians as to whether Stalin had blueprints for turning the world red. And the short answer is no. He was an opportunistic individual. He was looking for openings here and there. He moved when he felt uh, there was an opportunity for the Soviet Union to do something, but he was not necessarily absolutely dead set on promoting communism everywhere. But the longer answer is actually there was something like a blueprint for Stalin. The Soviet Union emerged from the Second World War as a superpower. It had a uh, huge military strength in Europe, more than anybody else. It was uh, unrivaled, except by the United States. But the expectations that the Soviet leaders basically entailed that the United States would stay out of Europe and that the Soviet Union would remain the predominant power. And so in the years up to the very end of the Second World War, so 43, 44, 45, Soviet policymakers started working on this great vision for the post-war. They had special committees set up to work through the questions of how the future world will look like. Surprised, they thought that the Soviet Union would basically be the dominant power in Europe. That's basically what Stalin subscribed to, of course. Later, it turned out that the United States would not stay put in the Western Hemisphere and, in fact, would push back against Soviet plans in Europe 
And I think that's how we uh, went from the post-war to the Cold War. I mean, as you said there, you spent a lot of time in China as well, researching this. What's the Chinese stance? I think we, we understand the American stance, we understand the Soviet stance. What about China? For Stalin and for other Soviet leaders, China was a big player. And indeed, throughout the Cold War, as you see Soviet policymakers making decisions about anything really that had to do with foreign policy, they always looked around to see what the Chinese reaction would be. For them, China was a huge factor in their thinking in a way that you would not have expected. For example, who would have thought that China played a big role in the uh, Soviet approach to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962? You, know, you don't read about this, right? This is a this, this is something that I personally found very unexpected. The second reason why I was really interested in the Chinese angle is to understand Chinese motivations in their relationship with the Soviet Union. Mao Zedong, ever since he concluded the Sino-Soviet alliance with Stalin in 1949, looked to the Soviet Union as a major partner for China. But then, of course, that alliance fell apart very quickly. It was supposed to be eternal and unbreakable. It, it fell apart within just 10 years. And there was a real struggle for leadership between the Soviets and the Chinese. And that was I was fascinated by why it was the Chinese felt that they, you know, they could not follow the Soviet leader, why the Soviet Soviets felt so annoyed about the Chinese that they had to basically press them down. And uh, this relationship between the Soviet leaders and the Chinese leaders is one of the most fascinating that I cover in the book, because now we have the records of conversations among the Chinese leaders and the Soviet leaders as they met in China, for example, repeatedly and talked about the future of the world and how they would overthrow capitalism and how they would blow up the United Nations and, uh, and so on and so forth. It's really crazy when you read these records, you realize just how delusional these people were. But for me, it was very interesting to understand what drove their differences, why they ended up hating each other so much. Well, maybe that's a good place to start. I think this conversation is really going to be talking a lot about some of these personalities, what you've learned, and what that might mean for today's world. So why not start there? What did you find about the Chinese leaders and the, the Soviet leaders? Why couldn't they get along, even considering they're supposed to be roughly from the same ideological background? And that is a big uh, a mystery, right? Because the Soviets and the Chinese supposedly shared an ideology and their alliance was supposedly ideological. And yet within just a few years, they developed a bitter hatred and uh, uh, confrontation. Uh, literally, they went to the point of a, a, a war in 1969 that they nearly fought, or not nearly, they actually fought a border war. And the Soviets we don't know to what extent this was a serious consideration, but certainly they hinted at the possibility of a preemptive nuclear strike against China. The Soviets saw themselves as the gods of the communist movement. They expected everyone else to defer to them. Now, while Stalin was alive, Mao Zedong was willing to defer to Stalin. He saw Stalin as a kind of almost in the Confucian sense, although Mao was very much anti-Confucian, but his behavior was very Confucian in some of this, in some of this matters. But he saw Stalin as this distant father whom he had to respect with a kind of filial piety. When Stalin died in 1953, he was replaced by Nikita Khrushchev, who from Mao's perspective was absolutely no one, a clown, that he did not have the kind of accomplishment, according to Mao's thinking, that Stalin had. So how could he defer to Moscow's leadership under those conditions? Of course, Mao wanted to take, or for China to take the, not so much to take the lead, but to stand on its own and not to listen to commands from Moscow. And so, and the Soviets were not willing to give that space of maneuver to the Chinese. They felt that the Chinese were upstarts, that they were too arrogant and that they should just keep quiet and follow the Soviet lead. And so that you can see this leadership struggle unfold in the late 1950s going into the 1960s. And I think this is what drove the split between these two communist Chines. Simply, the Soviets expected deference. China saw itself for great power, was not willing to defer. Could you tell us more about some of the archives you've been reading? Who are the characters that really stood out to you? What did you learn? And maybe what was different about some people? What was surprising to you as a researcher about some of the characters? I think, you know, everybody listening to this will know about Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Kennedy, Zedong, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is quite interesting. I had almost complete access to materials from Khrushchev's and Brezhnev's personal files, which included things like his records of conversations with foreign leaders, his various various pronouncements at the uh, in, inside the Kremlin at Politburo meetings, and so on and so forth. 
and also in Khrushchev's case, in dictations. Now, Khrushchev was not known for reading much. He, he never really read anything, frankly, but he loved to talk. And so he would dictate whole speeches every day, basically on every pronouncement that you can think of. In 1958, Nikita Khrushchev uh, started what became known as the Berlin Crisis after he proclaimed in the so-called Berlin Ultimatum. He was trying to push the Western allies out of West Berlin. You know, for a variety of reasons, basically, it was a, it was a, a economically problematic because people were going uh, over from East Berlin to West Berlin, escaping. And so this was a huge black hole in the heart of East Germany. He was trying to plug it. He was trying to get the allies out of West Berlin. And the way that he wanted to do that was to sign a peace treaty with Germany, which the Americans were also supposed to sign, but the Americans were not willing to do that. And so then the question came up, what if Khrushchev imposed a solution on Berlin and on Germany? In other words, he basically signed his own peace treaty with East Germany and the East Germans then kicked the Americans out. What would happen then? Now, there's a possibility that a war might happen, that the Americans might say, well, wait a second, we're not leaving West Berlin. We're going to hold to our rights here. We're not going to leave. And so there was a possibility that a war might erupt over West Berlin. Now, Khrushchev was trying to calculate the probability of this war, and he calculated that it was about 5%. Now, you might say, where did he get this number, 5%, you know, off the wall? But he thought that the Americans, he thought it was just be, it would be insane for the Americans to risk a nuclear war with the Soviet Union over what? Over Berlin? Who would want to fight over Berlin? That's ridiculous. So he thought that by putting pressure on the Americans, he would force the Americans to capitulate. He was building up the pressure in 1961. But when Bush came to shove, he decided not to overstep the line. And now, thanks to these new materials, we can really analyze his reasons for doing that. There's a very interesting document there in the archives about his discussion of the Berlin crisis in 1961, in the course of which he suddenly recalls a moment in 1941, thinking historically, this is when the Germans had invaded the USSR, the Soviets were basically collapsing, Soviet armies were retreating, Khrushchev was at that time in Kiev, and there was one of the Soviet generals who had just lost a big tank army, a guy called Nikolai Vashugin, came to Khrushchev and said, I've lost a tank army, what should I do? And Khrushchev said, well, I don't know. And Nikolai Vashugin pulled out a handgun and blew his brains out right in front of Khrushchev, which is a dramatic story, you have to admit. But what makes it even more interesting and more dramatic is that Khrushchev recounts the story in the context of the Berlin crisis, i.e. to emphasize that the Americans could not be trusted to be rational. What if they will blow the, their brains out? What if they will act irrationally and start a nuclear war over Berlin and not knowing the real certitude, the real probability of a war, Khrushchev decided to back off and did not push it to the brink. So that's just one example that I gave you from, you know, use, drawing on this materials and how we can almost psychoanalyze Soviet leaders. Absolutely. Well, could we talk a little bit about Brezhnev? Obviously, he was in charge of the Soviet Union for an incredibly long time. What did you learn about him? What, should, what do you think our listeners should take away? Brezhnev for me is uh, is an absolutely fascinating figure. A lot of people think of Brezhnev as the senile old fool who could not put two words together and was just a great embarrassment to the Soviet Union, which is true, but only after he suffered a health breakdown in 1974. So at that point, his health went right when you know right down down the drain. His mental capacity declined very sharply. He did not play much of a role in the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and many other decisions that were t uh, being taken around the uh, late 1970s. But in the early 1970s, on the other hand, Brezhnev played a key role in promoting detente with the United States. And this is counterintuitive because he came into office thinking that the Americans were vile imperialists who were conducting a hideous war in Vietnam. And until while this war was going on, he could not improve relations with the United States. But circumstances intervened. And that is where China comes in. China was a huge obsession for Brezhnev. He feared the China, not just feared, he hated passionately hated the Chinese. And he felt that the Chinese represented such a grave threat that now the Soviets had to basically turn to Europe 
turn to the United States. He repeatedly talked about himself as a European. He would say, I'm European, not like those Chinese. You can trust me. You cannot trust the Chinese. He also thought that Nixon was European. And so on this quasi-racial European basis, whatever that may be, he decided to reach out to Nixon. And he built a very personal relationship with him, which is really fascinating because they were leaders of rival superpowers. You would not think that they would become friends, but it's almost like they became friends in the Oval Office in June 1973. We have it on tape which is very unique for Cold War annals. And that why? That is because Richard Nixon was taping (laughs) meetings in the Oval Office, which, of course, ultimately brought down his presidency. But we have this remarkable meeting where Brezhnev just goes out of the way in a personal private meeting with President Nixon to be liked by Nixon, to flatter Nixon, to say how they they will develop this close personal relationship and bring their two countries together and so on and so forth. This is really fascinating because for me, it highlights it the importance played uh, by individual leaders in global events. And people like Brezhnev, you could uh, steer a whole country in one direction or a different direction. So this role played by individuals really comes through quite well. Well, we've talked about Brezhnev and Nixon. Do you, did you get a sense of how Soviet leaders felt about other Western leaders like Thatcher, Kennedy, whoever? What did you find? We, we find, for example, that Mao Zedong despised Kissinger. You know, a lot of people think that Mao Zedong and Kissinger or that Kissinger uh, was this great China hand. And, the, and today, of course, everyone, Kissinger recently died. The Chinese government uh, issued uh, appropriate condolences, et cetera, et cetera. But it's interesting at the time that Mao Zedong was very angry about Kissinger's diplomacy. And he would privately vent about him and say, well, Kissinger is is playing with us. He's trying to hold us for fools, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got this kind of, you, you've got this sort of stories in the archives. We have a lot on Kennedy. Uh, Khrushchev, for example, and his relationship with Kennedy was very interesting. Khrushchev was under impression that Kennedy was a puppet and that behind Kennedy, there was a deep state that controlled the United States. And he was convinced of this. He thought that Kennedy didn't actually have much of a role. But I think eventually he learned to appreciate Kennedy. I think that happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. They learned to appreciate each other, as a matter of fact, as as statesmen and policymakers. Brezhnev was looking forward to having a fairly productive relationship with President Carter. But that fell through because Carter was insisting on promoting human rights in the Soviet Union. And the Soviets were really upset by this. And the reason they were upset was not that because they thought that, that this would undermine the Soviet state or something like that, but they just felt that this humiliated them, this whole idea of teaching the Soviets how to behave, how that they should be, behave in a particular kind of way or abide by uh, promises that they have made in the, in the Helsinki Declaration for example, etc. I mean, that they found really deeply humiliating. So they were very angered by Carter. You've laid out such a compelling story of the Cold War through the sort of the personal relationships of the states people involved. Let's start to bring it to today. How different do you think, and in what ways do you think they're different, are the leaders of today to those that you've been studying in the archives? I'm thinking particularly in, in the Russian context, obviously, Vladimir Putin current president in the American context, somebody like Joe Biden. How different are they? What similarities do you see? What differences? So there are both similarities and differences, certain continuities. I mean, that's one of the big arguments of the book, that there's a continuity between the Cold War and the post-Cold War in the way we did not understand or appreciate in 1989 when the Cold War allegedly ended. Among the continuities, I would highlight the desire to be recognized. That really drives Moscow's foreign policy. However, there's a question to be recognized as who exactly or as what exactly, because you can be recognized. And this also, by the way, was a serious problem during the Cold War, because I talked about how Brezhnev wanted to be recognized, Khrushchev wanted to be recognized. You can be recognized as America's partner. It's always, for Russia as well, it's always America, America. You know, Britain, they were slightly obsessed about, but really they focused on America throughout the Cold War. This is the main recognizer for them. You can be recognized as their partner. And this is what Brezhnev wanted, equality with the United States. You know how my book is called To Run the World? This is what Brezhnev offered Kissinger in 1973. He said, they had a private conversation. He said, you and I, we can run the world together. We'll work together. You'll recognize us for equal partners. We'll run the world together, manage the world together, solve all the problems, etc. cetera. 
But there's another way to be recognized, and that is to be recognized as an adversary, a worthy adversary. And that too has a legitimating aspect for the Soviets. So they could be recognized as a partner by the Americans, or they could be recognized as an adversary. And that also gave them importance or self-importance in their own eyes. Oh, the Americans are recognizing us as this great adversary. Therefore, we must be great, right? That is the logic. And I think this logic follows through without fail from the Cold War to the post-Cold War. There was a period in the 1990s where the Russians, President Boris Yeltsin in particular, was really looking for some kind of a close partnership with the United States. He wanted to be recognized as a partner, to use that sort of terminology. But Putin eventually decided that this was not on the cards and that he was not being given the kind of role that he really craved. Therefore, today, he wants to be recognized as America's key adversary by, you know, waging a war against Ukraine, but also by trying to undermine the international order in every way that he can. So by serving as this kind of disruptor, he's actually trying to gain recognition and to legitimize his own role in his country and in history. I think that's a really powerful and really interesting explanation of some of the similarities. What about the differences then? There was something very similar between Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Andropov, Gorbachev even. All of those people experienced the Second World War firsthand. Khrushchev lost a son, right? He was at Stalingrad. It made a huge impression on him. Brezhnev was in the Second World War. In fact, was wounded in close to Novorossiysk during the landing there. But today's Russian leader, Vladimir Putin, does not have this kind of personal experience. And you wonder whether that makes him more of a gambler. In fact, uh, during, the, uh, during the recent anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Putin actually went on record saying that he was not a Khrushchev. He said, I'm not a Khrushchev. He didn't explain what he meant by that. But I guess... I guess what he meant is that in a, in a situation like the Cuban Missile Crisis, he would not have backed off. Do you think this links back to something you said almost as a sort of throwaway remark earlier when you said the Cold War, you know, at 1989, 1991, when the Cold War allegedly ended? Uh, what do you mean by that? By that, I'm trying to imply, do you think it never really ended for, for certain homo sovieticus like Putin? Well, sure, exactly that. And of course, we also have uh, now China also in a position uh, to be potentially waging a Cold War. A few years ago, when at that time when I was still writing my book and I saw those continuities and I, I began talking about the kind of a, a continuous Cold War, people did not, certainly historians, did not really take me seriously, arguing that it didn't make sense to uh, highlight those continuities because the Cold War was a unique, distinct event. There was something ideological about it, you know, capitalism versus communism and so on and so forth. And so whatever we have today is a very different story and it's not the Cold War. However, I think in, in recent years, certainly after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also with deterioration of Sino-American relations, more people, including among academics, among historians, are beginning to embrace this notion the Cold War may not have been a singular, just one-off event, and that it may actually continue in various ways. And that, in fact, what we experienced for 30 years was an <laughs> interwar period in many ways, a short break along the continuum of unending Cold Wars. What makes this confrontation so unique and so different, for example, from anything that we have had before? After all, Europe had seen wars, the 30 years war, for example, that was that raged in the 17th century and had massive casualties across the European continent, or we might talk about parallels with the First World War or something like that. But no, we're in a different situation now. And what makes the situation tr truly profoundly different is the existence of nuclear weapons. And that is the game changer. And that, that uh, happened, of course, the nuclear revolution occurred in the 1950s. Uh, and since then, it, this factor never went away. So it is basically impossible to destroy this country countries that possess major nuclear arsenals from without, which provides for a kind of particular kind of a confrontation that we see that we were seeing or we have seen during the Cold War and that we're again seeing today. If we look back then over your work, looking at, let's call it Cold War I, what lessons do you think uh, policymakers should take from Cold War I when it comes to Cold War II? 
and the continuing confrontation with Vladimir Putin's Russia. And of well, course, the rise of China. Sorry, bring, bring the Chinese back in here as well. Of course, the Chinese factor is very important here as well. And of course, Russia and China are working together now in ways that we would not have expected even a few years back, working together to undermine the international order. Now, what are the lessons? I think one important lesson that we need to think about is that this confrontation tend to last. When Russia invaded Ukraine, a lot of people thought, surely... It seemed very dramatic and terrible, etc. But surely there was still a way to reverse the strength somehow and things would return to normal and we would go back to square one and rework our rescue our relationship with Russia and so on. I think some people still have this kind of fantasy about somehow finding the road back to Moscow or just picking up the phone. Let's call the Kremlin and we'll talk to Vladimir Putin. Everything will be sorted out. I'm sure some Republicans in the United States think in those terms, sadly. The reality is much more complicated because when the Cold War won, let's say, happened in 19, we can talk about one exactly, but it was a sliding. It was a, also it did not happen overnight, right? It sort of happened between 45 to 49. It took about four years to really unfold properly. Nobody expected that it would last for decades and decades. But what became clear in retrospect was that it certainly was not an unfortunate accident. It was not some kind of unfortunate misunderstanding. The Soviets wanted to dominate Europe. If they were not stopped by meeting counterforce from the United States and from the West, then they would be dominating Europe. It's as simple as that. They would just continue until they until somebody pushed back. And so... In thinking about where we are today, we need to understand this point that a, unless we react with resolve to Putin's aggression, that aggression will feed more aggression and more aggression. Uh, appetite comes in during eating, right? As the French saying goes, uh, and even today, just like Stalin, Putin may not have plans for dominating the world. I think it's reasonable to say he probably doesn't. What he does have plans for is for disrupting the world. And he's working very consistently with considerable foresight towards this goal. Unless we recognize that this is his long-term plan, we will not be able to hold our positions. One other lesson I saw you put on Twitter is implicit understandings are overrated. Can you explain what you mean by that? So this is a throwback to the early Cold War. Of course, during the early Cold War we had, or even before the Cold War, indeed, in October 1944, uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill traveled to Moscow and um, he signed with Stalin what became known as the Percentages Agreement, agreeing to divide southeastern Europe between the Soviet Union and Britain, basically, according to a certain table of percentages. <laughs> and what then you realize, and then there was a Yalta conference that also entailed kind of implicit division of spheres of influence and a kind of a degree of recognition of the Soviet sphere of influence. But surprise, when push came to show, Stalin did not abide by his side of the bargain. When Stalin saw opportunities, he went out there and pursued those opportunities, even though they contradicted implicit understandings that were reached uh, between him and and the allies. And the same, I think, would apply to Putin. There's, there's some people out there who argue, we just need to reach an implicit understanding with Putin divide spheres of influence. And let's say we give him X and he will abide by that and everything will be sorted. I don't think that this is a very reasonable approach to Putin. The reality is that, yes, Putin pocket any concessions that we give him until such a moment that he sees new opportunities to further his influence, to further ero erode Western solidarity, to further undermine the West. And he will exploit those opportunities because this is part of a broader vision that he has about the world, going back to this notion that this is not an unfortunate misunderstanding. This is part of a broader design, so to speak speak. And he will act in accordance with that design. So hoping that we can agree uh, in some backroom negotiating with Putin, strike a deal, so to speak, as, as, as Trump likes to say, the art of a deal. I would like to see what kind of deal could be struck with Putin at this point. Do you think that the West, the grouping of countries, NATO around the US and its allies and around Ukraine, understands the scale of the challenge ahead of them in the same way that they maybe did back in the 50s and the 60s or, or not? 
this was always a, an uphill struggle. It was always a challenge to keep Western solidarity simply because there are always players who don't like being ordered about within Western alliance, so to speak. Think about the French during the Cold War, leaving NATO military structures, for example. I mean, for de Gaulle, it was how important it was for France to stand on its own feet and so on. And today we have countries like Hungary and some others, Turkey, that sometimes present really serious challenges. And of course, part of the Soviet strategy during the Cold War was to play different Western allies against one another. The Soviets really tried to play Germany against France against Germany, France and Germany against the United States, they were desperate to break up NATO throughout the Cold War. I think that continues, but there's a, a silver lining here, and that is Moscow, through its own aggressive actions, tends to actually bring the Western allies together in the way that would never have happened otherwise. NATO, by now, would have long fallen apart, except for the fact that Russia keeps it alive through its own stupid policies and unrepentant imperialism. So if there's a good story, then this is the story. And aggression shows us the rights and the wrongs and helps us, helps us bring ourselves together in the West and res resist this aggression. My final question then, Sergei, just looking back over the past 10 years of your research and reading, as you said, you, you felt like you got to know some of these leaders as people. What is the anecdote that sticks in your mind the most? Out of all your reading, you'd go to first if you were explaining your book and if you were explaining just how you understand these leaders now after, after reading so many stories, after reading their own thoughts. That's a good question. There's so many interesting anecdotes. I guess one of my, one of my favorite is it's not so even so much an anecdote, it's an interesting piece of evidence that we did not know about. And that is why Stalin gave the permission to Kim Il-sung of North Korea to invade South Korea. I mean, historians have long wondered about it because this was not initially the plan. Stalin was too careful. He, he was worried about American intervention. He, wouldn't, he didn't want to do that. Now we have this remarkable document, which I talk about in my book, where in 1956, one of uh, Stalin's sidekicks, Anastas Mikoyan, traveled to Beijing and Mao Zedong asked him point blank, said, why did you approve the invasion of South Korea? And um, Mikoyan gives an answer. What do you think the answer is? Uh, I don't know. Okay, I'm, I'll take a guess at it. Is it linked to your earlier point that it's Moscow that's leading the communist revolution, so they will decide what, what happens, and it's, and it's their advice that the revolution continues. They were deciding. That's why Kim Il-sung and you know, Mao Zedong, they all deferred to Moscow. They all deferred to Moscow. And if Stalin said no invasion, there would not have been an invasion. But it turns out, and Mikoyan answers this, that they intercepted American intelligence that suggested that the Americans would not fight for South Korea. And so they thought the risk was pretty low. Isn't that interesting? Wow. And that, what, what an almighty miscalculation. That was a big miscalculation on their part, but it also highlights the importance of signaling the right sort of message. Because when they see an opportunity, if they see an opportunity to get in there, remember, you know, George Cannon in Long Telegram I wrote about, said, Soviet power is not like that of Hitlerite Germany, yeah, impervious to the logic of reasons, highly sensitive to the logic of force. If they get the wrong message, or if they think that they will not be, they will not encounter resistance, they'll just get in there, and Korea proves that. Sergei Vancheko, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Battle Lines is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our news, analysis, and dispatches from the ground in Israel and Gaza, subscribe to The Telegraph, or sign up to Dispatches, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from contributors to this podcast. If you appreciated the podcast, please consider following Battle Lines on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. As disinformation is a particular problem during conflict, we are relying on your support more than ever. Battle Lines is part of wider Telegraph foreign coverage in our podcasts. If you're interested in finding out more about the war in Ukraine, you can listen to Battle Lines' sister podcast, Ukraine the Latest. Battle Lines is produced by David Dargahi, and the executive producers are Louisa Wells and David Knowles. <laughs>